happy little games. The Prehistoric Caveman They have been around since the dawn of time and have ingratiated themselves into our pop culture. The general public have been fascinated with these large, knuckle-dragging, club-wielding creatures for as long as I can remember. I was first made aware of the comical appeal of the prehistoric era thanks to the comic strip BC. Next up were reruns of the Flintstones, which started my lifelong love affair with Winston cigarettes. Currently, I'm up to five packs a day. Today, though, we are not talking about any of those prehistoric people. We are talking about another scruffy, fluffy, dirty, flirty individual. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Joe and Mac, Caveman Ninja. What is a Caveman Ninja and what does he have to do with our game? How does Karnov and Bad Dudes factor into this? So grab your club and watch out for the dinos. This is the history of Joe and Mac, Caveman Ninja. The year is 1990 and Data East designer Makoto Kikuchi is planning his next arcade game. His previous works always seem to add a bit of humor to his games, such as Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninja, in which after rescuing President Ronnie, he offers to take you out for a cheeseburger as a nice reward. He also contributed designs for 1987's arcade game Karnov, who is a fire-breathing Russian who has to deal with dastardly monsters. Mr. Kikuchi wanted to stick with a standard platformer, but had not decided upon a theme until they came across a Commodore 64 title by the name of Caveman Uglympics. Caveman Uglympics, or Caveman Games as it was later known on the NES, was a track and field style game that was centered around cavemen and all their wacky athletic shenanigans. Some of the events you could participate in were fire making, clubbing, and dino race among others. There had been a few instances of cavemen in video games prior to this such as BC Quest for Tires, Bonk on the PC Engine, and Chuck Rock, which included a dinosaur who couldn't quite get to the toilet quick enough. Mr. Kikuchi thought this would be a great premise for the arcades. He wanted to include a two-player co-op mode which found great success in his previous arcade hit Bad Dudes. The original Japanese title was Joe and Mac Tadakai Genshijin, which loosely translated into Joe and Mac Caveman Fight. Somewhere along the way, the translation was muddied down even further to Caveman Ninja. There was also speculation that it could have been a reference to Data East earlier arcade title Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninja, or simply Dragon Ninja as it's known in certain parts of the world. Joe and Mac was released into the arcades in 1991 by Data East. As the story goes, a group of nasty and nefarious cavemen have kidnapped some bodacious cavewomen, and it's up to Joe and Mac to bring them back. It won't be easy though as there are plenty of prehistoric obstacles and pratfalls, not to mention giant-sized dinosaurs. This is a two-player co-op game with one player taking on the role of Joe and the other taking on the role of Mac. The game is spread across six levels with a mini-boss at the end of each one. The various levels you will traverse are Jungle, Dinosaur Graveyard, Volcano Waterfall Ride A Cliff And finally into the belly of the beast among others You 
your starting weapon is an axe, which at various times can be thrown both vertically and horizontally. Various other weapons can be gathered, including boomerangs, stone wheels, fireballs, and shadowy doppelgangers, which will run forward and attack. By holding in the attack button, you will unleash a larger, more powerful version of the current weapon you are carrying. There is also a hot sauce power-up, which will turn you invincible and allow you to breathe fire for a short period of time. If you happen to get smashed by an enemy, you will turn flat and stupid just like my 8th grade girlfriend. Although this only lasts a few seconds, you can still move around and attack. You can also do a super somersault jump. Rather than use a one-hit kill system, you have a large health bar which slowly depletes over time similar to the arcade game Wonder Boy. Obviously, if you get hit, the quicker it will go down. Thankfully, there is a ton of food to collect on the levels to keep your blood sugar high. If for some reason you do get killed, thankfully you are sent back to a checkpoint. Certain levels will end with a split path allowing you to choose which way to go. After completing each stage and rescuing one of the cave women, you are given a nice little kiss on the cheek and treated to a short cutscene. All of the characters are animated perfectly and have very expressive facial features. At the end of the first stage, your character looks like he just dropped a deuce after seeing the giant T-Rex for the first time. Some of the other bosses you will encounter at the end of each stage include a pterodactyl, a brachiosaur, and a woolly mammoth, among others. The level design is fantastic with plenty of color and personality throughout, such as hitching a ride on a dinosaur across the river. The backgrounds feature lots of animation and some with multiple layers of parallax scrolling. There are three different endings in the game that involve our heroes being chased either by an effeminately dressed caveman, a rather large cave woman, or a pack of wild cave women hotties. Now I won't say which ending is the best, nor will I say which ending is the worst. It's whatever floats your boat. I just think it's very cool that we got multiple endings and it really adds to the replay factor. There were a few conversions made, but we will talk about those at the end of the video. 1992 saw the release of Congo's Caper on the Super Nintendo. Released as Tadakai Genshijin 2 in Japan, this is more of a straight up platform game than the original arcade title. This game definitely shows its console roots with an art style more generated towards younger kids. For the most part though, it's a completely different game that takes place across 6 worlds with 4 levels in each. There are also 10 more levels that are hidden. Once you beat the first world, you can play the remaining 4 in any order. There are also many bosses scattered throughout. This doesn't star Joe and Mac, but a new protagonist by the name of Congo, who is half human, half monkey, and all man. Your girlfriend Kongyet has been kidnapped by the evil Demon King and it's up to you to rescue her. The simultaneous two-player mode is gone as are all of your projectiles. Instead, you have to rely on your puny club. You start out life in human form, but if you take a hit, you devolve into a monkey. If you take another hit in your monkey form, you will die. Scattered across the levels are various red gems. If you are in your monkey form, it will upgrade you back into a human. However, 
If you collect three of them while in human form, it will turn you into Super Congo, which is a more powerful version of yourself. This gives you the ability to jump higher and hover. There are yellow gems scattered all across the world, and if you collect 100 of these, you will gain an extra life. There are sapphires on the levels to pick up as well. If you pick up three, you can spend it on the slot machine, which could result in you gaining extra lives or the ability to warp to a different level. There are diamonds hidden throughout the levels, which if you find one, will give you an extra life. On one of the levels is a statue of either Joe or Mac. The stages you will encounter are the valley, speeding stage, ghosts and ghouls. and the final kingdom. Some of the mini bosses you will encounter are a T-Rex, a pirate, and a demon king among others. Once you defeat the Demon King, your girlfriend is reverted back into her human form and all does right with the world. While not a true sequel to the arcade game, it is still fun to play in its own right. Joe and Mac 2 Lost in the Tropics was released for the Super Nintendo in 1994. This was released outside of Japan as Joe and Mac 3, which further cements Congo's Caper as Part 2 in the series. This is a platform game that plays similar to Congo, but visually looks more like the arcade original. As the story goes, a naughty caveman by the name of Gork has stolen the crown of the tribal chief of Kali Village. It's up to our prehistoric friends Joe and Mac to retrieve it by picking up the seven stones scattered across the world. Yes, the two player simultaneous mode is back which was sorely missing in the last game. You still only have your puny club but it can be upgraded to different weapons such as hammers and spiked clubs which will come out as projectiles. After eating the fruit and meat for health, you have the ability to spit out things such as seeds when you eat fruit, bones when you eat meat, or breathe fire when you eat a hot pepper. Also similar to Congo, after completing the first world, you have the option to tackle the next four in any order you like. The game takes place across six worlds with a mini boss at the end of each one. The levels you will traverse are Deep Tropics, Snowy Rockies, Murky Swampland, Scarlet Carpet, Cali Village, and Gork's Lair. Some of the mini bosses you will fight include an icy Stegosaurus, a T Rex. and a giant pterodactyl among others. 
rather than collect gems as in the first game, you have to collect stone wheels which can be used in shops to purchase things such as health upgrades, strength upgrades, and remodeling your hut. The big one though was the option to buy flowers for a cave woman. If she likes your flowers, she will marry you. If you buy her the flowers that she likes two more times, she will magically pop out a kid even though you were nowhere near her. Makes you wonder what she's been up to while you've been out battling dinosaurs. There were also rideable animals all throughout. The graphics look really good with large expressive sprites and loads of colors on screen. The backgrounds look impressive with multiple levels of parallax scrolling which is nice and smooth. The game is certainly fun to play, especially with a mate, so check it out if you haven't had the chance. Nineteen ninety four saw the release of Joe and Mac Returns in the arcades. This is a sequel to the arcade game Tumble Pop mixed into the world of Joe and Mac. The game is a two player single screen platform affair that sees our prehistoric heroes attempt to rescue all of the various cave women. You have to club all of your enemies and bag them. Once you bag them, you can throw them across the screen to take out any other hostile cavemen. After freeing the damsel in distress on each level, she will shower you with gifts such as health and power-ups. One of the power-ups is a stone wheel which can be rolled across at the enemy to knock him down complete with bowling pin sound effect. The game is set across six worlds with a giant boss to fight at the end of each one. The usual levels are here including a volcano, A jungle, underwater, an icy cavern, and more. Some of the big bad bosses that you will encounter are a piranha. Triceratops, a woolly mammoth, a pterodactyl, and more. The graphics are excellent with large sprites that are extremely detailed. Sound effects and music are really good with plenty of voices all throughout. There are even humorous cutscenes in between each level. The gameplay sort of reminds me of Bubble Bobble, which is not a bad thing. The game was never converted to any home system, but it was recently released on the Nintendo Switch. Joe appeared without his brother Mac, but alongside Dirk the Daring from Dragon's Lair in the elite Game Boy puzzle game Frankie, Joe, and Dirk on the tiles. Our favorite prehistoric duo also appeared in the German comic book Super Mario Lost in Time. It was included on the compilation disc Data East Arcade Classics for the Nintendo Wii. It featured 15 classic Data East Arcade games such as Bad Dudes, Burger Time, and more. It was also released for the Zebo system in Brazil. An HD remake was announced back in 2009, but for whatever reason, it was cancelled. The only thing we ever got to see from this were some pieces of concept art. A retro cartridge, which included the first three Super Nintendo games, was released and is still readily available on both Amazon and Walmart. The price is under $30, so it's more than reasonable in my opinion. A tabletop version of Caveman Ninja was also released from the company My Arcade. This is very reminiscent of the original cabinet, but unfortunately it's only the NES version we get and not the arcade game. 
An updated version has also been announced for the upcoming Amico system, but so far there is no release date. Now let's go over the conversions. The one most people are familiar with is the Super Nintendo version. Graphically, it looks very close to the original arcade game with large, detailed, well-defined sprites and smooth animation. After getting into it for a few minutes, you'll notice that the levels are expanded in length. There is also a map screen similar to Super Mario World, and occasionally you will find hidden keys scattered throughout which you can use to unlock gates. Your health meter no longer dwindles, instead you have a large health bar which has 5 hearts. Every time you take a hit, it will go down by half, so essentially you can be hit 10 times before dying. Speaking of dying, instead of going back to a previous checkpoint, you will be resurrected on the same spot. The enemies also take multiple hits this time, instead of only one in the arcade game. You can no longer charge your weapons up, but there are various power-ups found throughout. The game is missing any rideable dinosaurs, and there is only one ending as opposed to three. A lot of the facial expressions and humor found in the arcade game are also missing. The game was also censored here in the States, with the opening scene of the cavemen dragging away the cave women completely removed. The extra content more than makes up for the rather thin arcade levels. The Sega Genesis version is more of a straight up port of the arcade game. Just a few odds and ends are missing here, such as the facial expressions and the cutscenes between levels. Your health no longer dwindles in this version either. The colors have been downgraded significantly thanks to the Sega Genesis hardware. The gameplay is fantastic and really reminds you of the arcade original. You also have three different endings just like the arcade game. The music is arcade accurate with nice booming sound effects. The Game Boy version looks really good, especially for a handheld system at the time. Most of the arcade game has been pulled over intact with large detailed sprites and screen blur that has been kept to a minimum. The scrolling is a little choppy, but speed-wise it's pretty consistent with the arcade original. The music is only decent, but you do get a few nice digitized sound effects. It uses the same two-button controls as the arcade original and plays really good. Once again, more of a straight-up port of the arcade game, but this time the two-player co-op mode is missing, and you only have one ending available. Some of the bosses did not make it over, including the final giant caveman. The NES version is really scaled back when compared to the other ones, but for the hardware, it's really well done. There are loads of parallax scrolling and everything is silky smooth. While the sprites have been shrunk down, they are still well defined and they don't get lost in the background at all. You can still collect different weapons such as boomerangs, wheels, axes, and the most strongest is fire with the ability to charge them up. There were only five levels in total with the usual mini-boss at the end such as pterodactyls, T-Rexes, and giant cavemen. The endings have also been reduced down to one. The difficulty has been spiked up immensely, so even if you are pretty good with the arcade game, prepare yourself for a challenge. Your health still dwindles, but thankfully there is plenty of food to pick up along the way. It is only single player though.
Next up is the Amiga version and this definitely is in my top 10 conversions for the system. Graphically, it looks very similar to the arcade game but the colors have been reduced down even further from the Sega Genesis version. The backgrounds look great with plenty of parallax scrolling to boot. The game follows the arcade's layout to a T, but it is missing some of the bells and whistles such as the opening animation and the more humorous aspects of the game. The music and sound effects are really good with nice digitized sound samples straight from the arcade game. The game controls very well, especially when you use a Sega Genesis 3 button pad. There is pretty much no ending to speak of aside from the congratulatory text-only screen. And finally, we have the best version in my opinion, which is the MS-DOS version. We have 256 colors at our disposal to start the game off with, including the full intro animation. This game looks extremely close to the arcade original with nice smooth parallax scrolling and extremely detailed backgrounds. The gameplay is fantastic, giving you the choice of either keyboard or joystick which also includes simultaneous two-player action. The music and sound effects complement the lush scenery and all in all, it's the perfect Joe and Mac package. Back in 1991, you could not ask for a better conversion than this. And that takes care of the history of Joe and Mac Caveman Ninja. It was always one of my favorite two-player co-ops thanks to its visually appealing style and humor. The bosses are large and in charge and even to this day I still play it every so often. If you've never had a chance to play around in the prehistoric era, be sure and give this one a shot. You'll be glad you did. If you enjoyed this video or any of my content, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you want to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you all so much for watching.